Why did you want to be involved in the January 6th committee? Why did you want to chair it? Well, uh, stepping back a little further, uh, ranking member Katko and myself uh, wanted to start a nonpartisan, unbiased effort on behalf of the House, uh, patterned after the 9-11 committee. And so we offered legislation that would uh, have a committee of not members of Congress, but more importantly, uh, it would be an even number, and that number uh, would give credibility to the effort to look into what happened during 9-11. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we moved forward on it, but we did not get the cooperation necessary uh, with the Republican leadership. Uh, we passed it uh, in the House, the Senate turned it down, and so ultimately, we all back to square one. Uh, Leader Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi at that time, looked at it and said, January 6th was too important of an event for us not to do the oversight or investigation necessary to see what happened. So uh, we looked at it, came back with a, a proposal uh, to form a select committee, which we have as uh, members of Congress the right to do. Uh, uh, we passed it. Uh, we actually wanted to include Republicans on the committee, uh, but what happened the Republicans uh, that were selected by the leadership, or the Republicans uh, at that time, they all were uh, of the opinion that January 6th, if you please, was just a, uh, the equivalent of a congressional tour, and that the election itself was basically null and void because the, the individuals appointed voted against the confirmation of the election. So Speaker Pelosi said, uh, we can have some of your people on there, but some of them have already publicly said their opinion uh, as to what went on, and that would not be the case. So uh, she then appointed Liz Cheney and Adam Kingsinger uh, to the committee as Republicans, but also uh, made it clear that she was open to other people who didn't have such a narrow focus on the investigation. And ultimately, uh, Leader McCarthy took all of the Republicans off the committee, uh, and the only two left were Cheney and Kissinger. Kissinger. Uh, so uh, that's where we are. And that's how we got formed. Uh, ultimately, uh, I've chaired or been the ranking member of Homeland Security since 9-11. And Speaker Pelosi said, you have the focus on domestic terrorism like no other. So you've been here since 9-11 uh, and since the committee was created. Uh, you should chair it. Uh, I didn't actively seek it, uh, more or less. I think she looked at, again, my legislative record and said, you're the person for the, cho for the job, and that's what I did. You've written, and in the statements you made at the, at the opening hearing, that it was also personal for you, that you'd seen your, your dad during Jim Crow and not being able to vote. Can you, can you help me understand how, how your past brought something to, to this investigation? Well, you know, you're the sum total of your experiences for the most part. For Benny Thompson's experience uh, living and growing up in the South, where the right to vote uh, was hard fought for African Americans, the fact that government resisted in the South with every fiber in its being to keep my family and people like my family from just casting a vote. And so uh, my opening statement more or less chronicle uh, my family's experience, my uh, father uh, never having the, the right to cast a vote before he died, uh, my mother teaching him 
uh, how to sign his name because black boys wasn't allowed to go to school. Uh, the Klan was uh, prevalent in all the communities uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, intimidating any act of what was called civil dis disobedience, which more or less was encouraging people to, to vote. And so uh, it was that backdrop that uh, I thought it uh, ironic that somebody who lived uh, a part of their life in a section of the country that denied inalienable rights uh, of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness to a group of people to now chair the January 6th committee, which is, uh, in my estimation, uh, one of the most historic committees uh, to come forth, given the importance of uh, what happened on January 6th. And for an African-American from the South uh, who didn't leave the South, but who's fought hard for civil rights and equal opportunity for all, to now chair the committee. You've talked about seeing the Confederate flag in the Capitol on January 6th. I mean, did you see a connection between what you'd grown up with and, and, and that moment and, and the right to vote? Well, one of the symbols of Southern resistance to voting rights and equal opportunity was the Confederate battle flag. And to see that flag being uh, waved by many of the protesters uh, brought back those memories that uh, there are people who, for whatever reason, uh, see the, the election of, of Joe Biden as an affront to that way of life, and that in order to protest it, uh, they came to Washington at what we've later learned was the president's invitation, and ultimately uh, wanted to show their identification with that flag. Uh, uh, I was instrumental in another juncture of getting uh, the Mississippi flag taken down in the Hall of Flags uh, because of that Confederate battle symbol uh, in the upper right-hand corner uh, of that flag. So, uh, uh, <laughs> incidentally, the, coincidentally, the House Administration Committee took all the flags down, didn't just take the Mississippi flag down. They, they, they said, well, we'll just take them all down. Well, I just wanted to take the Mississippi flag down because of that Confederate battle symbol, but they couldn't find the strength to say, you're right, that flag is objectionable and it should be taken down. But the voters of Mississippi, uh, as you know, voted to change the flag. So. So we were fortunate to get that uh, ballot symbol uh, flag taken down. But to see the individuals uh, waving that flag uh, brought back uh, some of the darkest days uh, of my life and the South in general. What would you say was the point of the committee? Because there was a lot of questions, as you know, about the committee, <laughs> about we saw January 6th, we saw it happen, we saw the president's tweets, we saw his speech. What did you, what did you set out to, to add to events that seemed so public uh, when you started? Well, I think the charge for the committee was to look at the facts and circumstances that brought about January 6th and make recommendations uh, to the Congress as to how we could uh, prevent that type situation ever happening again. So uh, we looked at it. Uh, with the broadest possible view uh, from a, uh, the committee's perspective and did just that. Uh, we, we took uh, all of the video we could identify with. We uh, subpoenaed witnesses to come before the committee. We talked uh, to anyone who wanted to talk to us and, and, and to try to get, if you please, to the bottom of what actually occurred. And so we spent uh, uh, almost two years in collecting that evidence. And, and so it was 
as we collected that evidence, it became clear to the committee that we had a serious problem uh, in this country that was developing around misinformation, around certain individuals promoting, uh, actually, just patently wrong information. And so, in, 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 in circumstances, if you repeat a lie long enough and often enough, in the, in, the, in the eyes and ears of so many people, it becomes the truth. Otherwise, why am I hearing it so much? And so our committee uh, set out to make sure that uh, we would only deal with the facts. And in our hearings we presented, uh, we would always invite anyone with opposing views uh, to come, offer themselves uh, as witnesses to the committee, but they'd have to do it under oath. And because we are a congressional committee, uh, you couldn't come and lie to us and not be charged with perjury. So we had no takers to, to come and offer themselves as opposing witnesses to what we did as a committee. How important was it that Liz Cheney was the vice chair of the committee of who she was as a Republican, as Dick Cheney's daughter. How important was, was her role? Well, I think it was important. I chose Liz Cheney as my vice chair. Uh, I didn't want uh, uh, the noise that I was hearing to take root that it was a partisan witch hunt. And so I felt no better person uh, to minimize that chatter than somebody who I'd never really spoken to in Congress, uh, who I knew her daddy, uh, I knew his philosophy, I knew her philosophy. Uh, and so you take an African-American uh, liberal and, and a white female conservative uh, to, to lead this committee, uh, you could take some of the opposition away so that people who just wanted to find out what happened uh, wouldn't buy into this notion that it was a partisan witch hunt. And so uh, we chose uh, Congresswoman Cheney. Uh, uh, from all indications, she did a stellar job as vice chair. Uh, we didn't always agree, but the notion is that it's a committee. Uh, there's a process that we went through. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, all the members of the committee voted in support of the report uh, that ultimately the committee produced. What, you said you hadn't spoken to her. Was there anything when you worked with her about her that surprised you? Uh, you know, I think the thing that surprised me the most was her commitment to making sure that not just getting uh, to the truth, but making sure that it left no room for the opposition uh, to, to find fault. They might not like what we present, but they can't say we were wrong in what we presented. And so uh, her continue in terms of making sure that we got all the information. And the fact that she had Republican credibility in the broader sense, a lot of the witnesses that we were able to bring to the committee came because of Liz Cheney's presence. Uh, some of them she knew, uh, a lot of them knew of her, and so, as you know, a majority of the witnesses that came before our committee uh, identified with the Republican Party. And so, a lot of that partisan witch hunt was uh, mitigated substantially uh, with her uh, involvement on the committee. Can you tell me about the hearings? Because one thing everybody has told us is that these hearings are not like other congressional hearings. 
Um, they're not orchestrated the same way. Um, how did that? How did they come together? What were you trying to do with the televised hearings? Why were they so different from from other other hearings? Well, we wanted to tell a story that the general public could understand. Uh, you know, for the most part, most congressional hearings, uh, with few exceptions, are about as boring as you can get. Uh, so what we wanted uh, to do is to make the hearings informative, uh, but also wanted the public to understand the, the gravity of the situation we, uh, as a country, had been faced with uh, because of January 6th. So uh, given the fact that Speaker Pelosi provided resources for us to bring uh, attorneys, researchers, uh, production capability to our hearings beyond what we had internally, it gave us an opportunity to tell our story. And in, in telling the story, we were able to uh, theme it out, so to speak, so that in producing the beginning, it became, uh, for those individuals who followed the hearings, at the end, they'd say, I can't wait till the next hearing. And so I think that was the production expertise that uh, members of Congress and regular staff didn't have uh, because we couldn't see in the eyes of the public what they needed to see in order to tell the story. And I think given the, uh, the numbers that uh, our hearings produced, I think we accomplished uh, the fact that people looked at them, uh, uh, people made an effort to uh, comment, uh, social media uh, presence was real. And a lot of the opposition, it didn't go away, but it didn't address the facts and circumstances our hearings produced. And, and, and again, our charge was to do just that. And that's what we did uh, as a committee is presented in the eyes of the public so that uh, they would understand. And I'm uh, so glad that we were able to find witnesses who found themselves and the strength necessary to come uh, publicly, either in the hearings or in the depositions, to give testimony that otherwise most hearings wouldn't have been able to garner. What was it like? I mean, you said, as you said, like tens of millions of people watched that first hearing. It's on primetime television. Um, the, the expectations have been high. As you know, a lot of people were saying, what was the committee finding? You'd been sort of quiet for a number of months. What was it like to gavel in that opening hearing? What was the room like? What were, what were you thinking as you convened it? Well, it was like, what in the world have we gotten ourselves into? Uh, we decided that we would interview those law enforcement personnel who had been uh, basically defending the Capitol on that day. Uh, what was their day like? What was their night like? Uh, how has it impacted themselves since that time? And, and so uh, I think the testimony of those four witnesses was uh, riveting in terms of uh, how they told uh, individually their experience of that day. And to see them in uniform, uh, I think had a real impact on the public. Saying that here are people who are sworn to protect the Capitol come to work on that day to do just that. And they are assaulted 
And, and in the back of the minds, I think, of a lot of people, they said, this was a bad day. Because, you know, some of our colleagues had tried to minimize what occurred on January 6th. And so when uh, we produced the hearing and the, the never before seen footage of some of the things that occurred, I think people got the, got the point that this really did happen. And what I saw with my own eyes did occur and we need to get to the bottom of it. So that, that gave the credibility of the committee that was needed in the beginning for us to then start moving uh, to doing and talking to other witnesses. And to be honest with you, we got better cooperation from a lot of our witnesses after that first hearing because the impact, we believe, of those officers' testimony uh, really went to the heart and soul of who we are as Americans. Uh, it's not you a Democrat or Republican, uh, you're an American. We can differ, uh, but we don't act like we did on January 6th just because my candidate didn't win. And so from that, uh, we were able to uh, to garner significant support uh, from Republicans and Democrats uh, to do our work. In the hearings in the spring and summer, you start laying out what Liz Cheney calls a multi-part or seven-part conspiracy. You in the, your opening statement um, talk about January 6th was the culmination of attempted coup to overthrow the government. The, the violence was no no accident. What were you What were you outlining over those series of, of of hearings. I mean, was that the indictment we see today? Was that the, were you outlining crimes um, by, by the former president? Well, we had to make our case and we had to make our case to the public. Uh, we had uh, volumes of evidence, but if we didn't tell it in our hearings where the public could digest it, then that aspect of our work uh, would be for naught. So we spent a good bit of time uh, with the depositions, with uh, the interviews of witnesses. Uh, we chased uh, uh, people all over the world, to be honest with you, to make sure that we got every bit of evidence as a committee we could so that when we produced a hearing, uh, it would be factual. Uh, irrefutable in terms of correctness and the fact that that uh, even the opposition would would be minimal to the hearing. So uh, we, we did that. Uh, we told the story as it related to individuals. Uh, we brought new players to the uh, to the story that here the four people didn't know much about. And uh, a lot of it's playing out in various courtrooms now. But we set the predicate in our committee uh, hearings that there were a lot of people involved in what happened on January 6th. And some of the people you know, some you don't know. And, and again, uh, the, the volume of witnesses was huge, but we had to reduce that volume to something that was manageable for the public. I think the first video in the spring when you're playing the depositions that you played during your opening statement is the former Attorney General Bill Barr saying what he had told you, the president, all these claims were, were BS. I mean, when, you, when that video clip plays, um, and I think it's the first time you're using these depositions, do you know that it's working, do you, you know, how impactful was that clip to see Bill Barr on the screen? Well, you know, this is the Attorney General of the United States of, of America saying basically all those claims that the election was stolen 
was BS, that they looked at it uh, high and low, and they found no measurable uh, outcomes that would have changed the election. Uh, but he didn't, his position had fallen on death ears. But for him, uh, under oath, to come forth and say that, I think it was very powerful. I mean, this is the top lawyer uh, in the Trump administration saying, I found no fault. And so for those who say uh, there was fault, they looked at every allegation, every community, and there was no creditable harm that could have changed the outcome of the election. So I think, I think that, was, that was powerful. And you know, this was from somebody who had defended the president in a lot of circumstances as attorney general. Uh, but I think uh, he understood the, the principles of democracy and truth. Uh, and that transcends uh, partisanship and politics. And I think his testimony uh, uh, set the, the precedent for the rest of the hearings. One of the things you lay out in one of the hearings and in the chapter in the, in the report is this idea of, of the big lie. In a lot of it, the committee's focus seems to be on showing, um, as you say, the opening statement that Donald Trump lost and, and knew that he lost. How important was it to prove uh, not just that the election wasn't rigged, but that that Donald Trump, uh, in, in the committee's view, knew that he he had lost. Well, I think it, you know you have winners and losers in any election, uh, and you can go to court, uh, you can ask for recounts, you can do all that. But at the end of the day, when none of those things uh, succeed then the only thing you can rely on is a lie. And that lie was uh, those individuals who told the president exactly what he wanted to hear. And it was our hearing that started focusing on some of those people uh, who told him what he wanted to hear. Uh, but we also focused on the people who worked for him who told him the truth. And so, there's a term uh, in, in the South that says, who are you gonna believe, me or your lying eyes? And so what we had going was the professionals in the administration saying we've looked at this and there's no truth to the fact that the election was stolen. But then we had what we commonly call the clown car of all these other folk uh, uh, from salesmen to uh, God knows who showing up at the White House as if they were experts on election law. And, and, and then we had others who creating theories that we don't have to follow the law, we can just invent uh, uh, other individuals who can purport to be uh, legitimate electors and, and challenge the whole election. Well, that's preposterous. And that was part of the big lie that uh, uh, the Trump administration bought into simply because they were telling him what he wanted to hear. And, and so the facts didn't matter. And so it was the committee's responsibility to show in no uncertain terms that the individuals, uh, no matter whether they're the attorney general, the White House counsel, other individuals, that they had told the president and his senior people around him that there's no truth in the fact when people say the election was lost. There's no truth. But there are other people out here who have no real standing uh, in the community who are saying otherwise. 
And when you believe those individuals over people who's taken an oath, uh, either as lawyers or, or as, as members of the executive branch, to, to support uh, uh, the Constitution of the United States, when you choose not to believe those individuals and believe just a ragtag bunch of people who just show up uh, uh, just because, quote, they support that administration, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not what you want to follow. And our committee's job was to make sure that, that we made it clear that the big lie was in fact just that. You tell, the, in, the, in the report, you tell the story of lots of pressure on local officials, on state officials, and in the hearings, you sort of have to, to distill it. And, and one of the, the people you used to do that is, is Rusty Bowers. Why did you choose his story? What was it about Rusty Bowers' testimony that, that, that struck you as important or powerful? Well, you know, here's a, 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 a Republican uh, speaker of the Arizona uh, legislature and a uh, very powerful person who's being asked to break the law, and he refused to do it. Uh, he said, uh, I'm not going to do that uh, now, uh, and, and agreed to be a witness, you know. Uh, uh, and he came before the committee, told the truth. But more importantly, he shared his personal story about the threats uh, on him, his family, how people staked out his house. And as you know, ultimately, uh, he lost his election uh, because of that. And so, but he too, like Liz Cheney, put country over party. And I think that began to show how our committee was, in fact, not a partisan witch hunt. But we just trying to get to the facts. And so after that, uh, we started showing the, the electors who were selected to um, represent certain states. You know, uh, John Eastman and some others concocted this idea that they could uh, <coughs> create their own group of electors and submit the, the statements uh, uh, here to Washington that they would in fact uh, be the legitimate electors in that. I mean, that was, you know, that's part of that big lie, but it manifests itself in intimidating people, um, you know, people in Michigan, people in Georgia, all, all those states where the submissions were produced. But, but again, it had no fact in law to start with. And, and so who are you gonna believe? The people sworn to do this for a living uh, in the administration or people outside the administration who are just dreaming up uh, that uh, machines were uh, orchestrated by people and influenced by people overseas. Just, you know, it almost became, well, well it, it was unbelievable, but some of the rationales being put forth by some people who have already pled guilty uh, in, in some of the cases, that um, it was all a lie. <laughs> you know, you hold the press conferences, you make all these allegations, and ultimately, your first real day in court, you plead guilty uh, to exactly what you were holding press conferences saying that it did happen. So that's, again, part of that big lie and other individuals who part and parcel uh, are also pleading uh, 
guilty in, in courts of law. So uh, I think so much of our work as a committee uh, in Congress is now playing itself out in courts of law around the country. You mentioned the impact on, on Rusty Bowers. The committee also has the testimony of Shea Moss and the deposition of, of Ruby Freeman. How um, impactful was that for you? And, and did that did that did their testimony remind you of some of those things you you brought from your childhood? Oh yeah. Look, look. I have uh, I've been elected to public office over fifty years. Uh, in most instances, I was the first person of color. Uh, to run for the particular office that I won. Uh, I always had to have uh, good people working the polls. I had to have people who understood the law. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they were great patriots. They just wanted to make sure that elections would run fair, run fair in, in, in my respective community. So what I saw in those two ladies were people who took pride in running elections fair and square, just like the book calls for. And so when the president started going after them uh, as some uh, cabal of people who uh, steal elections, it was horrible. They were just a uh, mother and a daughter doing their civic duty. Uh, and so for them to be uh, actually pointed out by President of the United States. That's horrible. And, and so after we, uh, our team of people talked to them and we said, you know, this is exactly what the public need to see because in all our communities, there are a group of people who pride themselves on running fair elections. Most of them are either retired or they just do it as a civic duty. They don't make a lot of money, uh, but they pride themselves on being able to conduct free, open and fair elections. And so for those two ladies, to be singled out as part of some conspiracy to take the election from uh, uh, the Trump administration was horrible. And uh, we've been able to have them as a witness for our committee. I think it was very powerful. And, and so uh, people say, you know, I know somebody just like those two ladies in my community who work elections, and they are just everyday people. Uh, and so the unfortunate thing that has uh, continuing ramifications uh, for what occurred with those two ladies is so many people have just decided it's just not worth it. I'm not going to you know, work elections anymore. So now uh, we'll see in the not too distant future what the displacement of all these people will bring on the next election. The committee lays out a lot of a lot of pressure on different officials from the Justice Department, culminating with the vice president, um, with the attempt to get him to to intervene uh, on January 6th. And you wrote in the in the foreword um, to the report that you were frightened about the perils of democracy um, as you look back on these events. Um, how close did we come? How close did we come at a moment with, with the president pressuring Pence or, or, or over these, these events? Let me tell you, um, I'm still concerned that that mindset of people um, thinking that the election was stolen is still out there. Uh, we are about to elect a person uh, to the third highest position in government in the House of Representatives, and a majority of those people being considered uh, are election deniers. 
So that means that so much of what the vice president resisted and, and some others is still prevalent uh, in this day and time. But Vice President Pence followed the Constitution. Uh, it specifically prescribes that uh, his, I mean, he's, he's basically ceremonial uh, in terms of what occurs. Uh, but they tried to say, you can stop this, you can do that. You can't do it. So I think that his resistance to the pressure uh, uh, is part of the reason that the president took out after him uh, in his speech at, uh, uh, just before the, the march uh, and the fact that those individuals who did break into the Capitol wanted to hang Mike Pence. Was all that was part of the rancor that developed around him not doing the bidding of former President Trump. And so, you know, we looked at a lot of what the, pres the vice president was doing during the, the uh, insurrection here at the Capitol. And it was obviously that he came perilously close uh, to getting hurt. Uh, and the fact that, uh, to his credit, uh, he did not take the Secret Service advice and leave the Capitol. He stayed, uh, he provided uh, direction uh, to what was going on. And I think he offered the stability uh, at the moment that the president refused to do. When you hear about the federal indictment, how important is that? The committee had referred um, had made a criminal referral to the Department of Justice. Um, and when you hear, this is the federal January 6th indictment, when you hear news of that and, and you read it, do you know how important is it? Do you see the work you have done um, reflected in that? Uh, yes, but on two fronts. To be honest with you, uh, and this is Bennett Thompson's opinion, uh, had it not been for the work of the committee and and how we presented that work to the public. I'm convinced it offered significant pressure on the Department of Justice that they're gonna have to do something. I think had not the committee been formed or the House looked at January 6th, I'm not certain that the Department of Justice really would have done anything uh, in terms of looking at it prosecution, special counsel, all that. I just think all what we see now is a byproduct of the work of the January Select Committee. And, and how important is, is an indictment? How important is criminal responsibility? Oh, no question. Nobody's above the law, not even a former president. And the fact that uh, a lot of the evidence that uh, we uncovered uh, is now in the hands of either the uh, attorney general or the district attorney in, in Georgia, uh, we did a lot of their background investigation for them. But we were not a criminal body. Uh, we were an oversight investigative body, but we reserved the right to share our work product with any group that wanted it. And, and so, uh, as you know, in the middle of our work, DOJ asked us for, for the information. And we said, well, we're not through. Once we complete our work, we'll be happy to give it to you. Uh, because we felt that our job was to get to the facts and circumstances and to involve anything else in that body of work uh, would not be in the best interest of our charge. And so uh, we kept plodding along, doing what was required, and ultimately uh, we've shared everything that uh, the department has asked us to share with them. And for that matter, if the public is interested in, in our work, <laughs> you know, uh, it's available. 
uh, for the public to read, all 850 plus pages. And God knows how many attachments that go with it. But uh, I think in that work, you will find clearly that not only was the past administration one of the main causes for what occurred on January 6th, but it was the people that he relied on to foster that lie are now having their day in court as criminals. And the people who professional advice he didn't rely on are going about their everyday life uh, as citizens of the United States. As you said, you did all of this work. You lay out all of the evidence. You have all of the attachments and the depositions. You have the public hearings. You've got the report and millions of people watch it. And yet, as you say, you know, a majority of the candidates for, for speaker were um, uh, uh, voted against certifying the election. The former president is now the leading nominee of the Republican Party. You can look at the polls in the Republican Party and see the needle hasn't moved very much. I mean, how do you feel about about that after all of the work you've done on this, after seeing how, how close you feel we came to seeing the the state of, of public opinion of, of the Republican Party today? Well, uh, I think we told our story. Uh, I'm convinced in that. But I'm also of the opinion that democracy uh, is, is fragile and that unless those of us who believe in this democracy continue to practice it and preserve it, that what occurred on January 6th could very well happen again. Uh, when the person who fostered it, January 6th is the leading candidate for a party running for president of the United States, that tells you that there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misinformation being circulated. And unfortunately, uh, uh, in America, one has opinions, whether they're right or wrong. It just, in this instance, I think there's so many people who have been uh, fooled by uh, partisan politics that they have not viewed the facts as we presented them. But again, people have choices. I'm convinced that the work of our committee, uh, long term, will be viewed as one of the, uh, the hallmarks of this great institution or experiment called democracy. My last question, I mean, you studied this very perilous moment in, in American history, and now here we are facing another election, facing a president who's been indicted, who's attacking the court system uh, with, with the Republican Party. It is. I mean, has the peril passed? Are, are we still in a, in a perilous moment? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, democracy is still an experiment. <laughs> you know, it can go good or bad uh, when somebody can have 90 plus uh, charges against them and lead uh, the, one of the major political parties and is to say that we are challenged as a country. But I'm a firm believer that uh, even in the worst of times, uh, in situations like this, the people will prevail. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to put the story out where people can interpret uh, for themselves what actually went on. Uh, and that was part of what we did as a committee is to put the facts before the public. And then we were convinced that once those facts were presented to the public, they'd make up their own mind. So uh, I still run up on people that I don't know who thank me. Uh, uh, for the work of the committee. Uh, every now and then I run up on somebody who's not so happy, but I'm so thankful that I run up on more who are happy uh, for the work of the committee.